Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. I give honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, and declare that his name is the only name whereby men shall be saved. I am Donald L. Kirkwood, the senior pastor of Gospel Truth Tabernacle of God Church in the wonderful city of Detroit, Michigan, and I welcome you all to another episode of From the Pastor Desk. I will grant time for questions and comments at the end of our lesson. As always, if you wish to comment or ask a question, just press the number five and the star key on your telephone keypad, and that will indicate to me that your hand is being raised. At that time or at the appropriate time, I will give you the opportunity to present your comment. The recording of tonight's lesson will be available approximately one hour after we get off the air. Just go to our church website at GTT Detroit, GTT, which, which is uh, Gospel Truth Tabernacle, gttdetroit.org, and click on the media tab. There you will find today's lesson along with many other spiritual uh, uh, clips that will allow you to uh, bask in the presence of God. Today's lesson is the uh, the final lesson. Hopefully, uh, I can get it all in tonight, but it will be the final lesson on spiritual warfare. Should be about spiritual warfare number seven, I believe. But it will be the final presentation on spiritual war- warfare. So let's prepare ourselves now to go before the throne of grace, and then we'll get into our conference. Father God, I thank you for each and every voice, each and every person who is online tonight, God. I thank you for a full house. This is the largest group we have ever had, God, and we're thankful for that. I pray now that you will continue to bless each and every one who is here. Meet us in the area of our needs, God. You know what needs we have. You know the suffering that some is taking, the physical uh, breakdown that some people's bodies is going through. But, God, you are still God. And we pray and we look to you to make a move. We look to you to heal. We look to you to set free. We look to you to make to take the pain and move it, God, that we will be able to give you glory and be a testimony, God, and let the people know just how you, our Father, has moved. We thank you that this word is not just uh, 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 sealed and not just uh, uh, set aside for a few, but it's open to everyone on the airways, God. Even in our recording functions, God, we're thankful that once we put it online, God, it's, it's open to to the world. All people have to do is click onto the link. So, God, we're thankful for this. We're, we're not hiding this word. We're just grateful to to proclaim it and let people know who you are. We pray now, God, a special prayer over those who are sick and afflicted and are online right now. God, touch their body right now. They need a healing, a touch from you. You know the situation, whether it's the knee, the stomach, the arm, the back, the leg, the neck, or whatever part of the body that is afflicted, God, even the mind. We pray right now that you would touch it, God. And Father, we lift El Paso, El Paso Texas. We lift up uh, Dayton, Ohio, these towns that are the latest victims of random shootings, God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bind the enemy. We know the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. We know the enemy wants to go out and cause confusion, God. We bind it in the name of Jesus. And you said in your word that it, it would not, uh, uh, Satan would not have full reign because of the spirit, the Holy Ghost that is in the land. So, God, we're grateful that even though there's some things that's going on, we are still holding back. The mass attack that Satan wants to cause. Now, God, help us to prepare that we can touch and reach out to people that are hurting. Let us be able to, to bring people into the fold. And we're thankful that our church has taken the stand, God, of fasting. Every day this week until three, God, we take, we're thankful that you have given me the, the, the vision to, to impart that to the church, and the church willfully accept it. We stand against suicide, God. We have a number of suicides that's been going on, and we stand against it, God. We come against every family that's affected. 
And we pray their strength. We we pray their strength, God. And we pray that you give us a word in season that will minister to the needs of those that are hurt. Father, we're thankful for our conference tonight. And we pray now that you would continue to be there and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. This is one of those times I didn't even have to have a, a conference. I could have just pray the whole hour, it seemed like. But God knows uh, uh, I'm going to still pray when I get off the air. We don't have to be on the air to pray. And I encourage you to keep lifting up the families and the people that are hurt. You may know some specifics about people hurting. If you do, don't forget to lift them up. Praise God. We want to begin again uh, uh, our lesson. Praise God. It's, it's uh, still dealing with, uh, uh, let me pull this up. Our lesson is still dealing with the sword of the spirit. We're still in dealing with spiritual warfare. and We're, we're just so grateful to you that you are the one who has started so much in our lives. Oh, my God. Where would we be without you? <laughs> Where would we be without you? Father God, we left off. Uh, we left off talking about Matthew's four one through eleven. Matthew's four one through eleven. We was talking about how Jesus went into the wilderness. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and uh, we talked about how he fasted for forty days and forty nights, and and all that. And then we went into talking about how the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacles of the temple and said, "You are the Son of God." Throw yourself down, for it is written, the Logos, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in the hand they shall bear you up, uh, and lest, your, lest you dash your foot against the stones. And I begin to talk about something. I begin to tell you that Jesus conquered temptation with the word. That's what we left off talking about, how Jesus conquered temptation with the word. Well, what I also want to add as we begin this session, is that Jesus was challenged and tempted by, take, by, by the devil time after time after time. I made this statement back uh, not too long ago. Uh, don't think just because you say a word or you quote a word that the Satan is going to run away and leave you alone. No, no, no. Here we have proof that Satan is going to come back. And he tempted Jesus three times in a row. And so what are we to do? So the question then, Pastor, give me something. Uh, what should I do then when I start getting all these temptations? The enemy said, well, the enemy will come and tell you. He'll tell you that you're too ugly, too, you're too fat, you're too dark, you're too skinny, you're too whatever. And, and the enemy knows how to, to find that thing about you that you're most ashamed of. You know, and that's the thing that I want you to understand. The enemy knows all about you. He'll find that thing that, and he'll sing that song regarding that issue. Well, that's what the enemy said, but the, but the answer is, what does God say? God says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and you got to learn to sing that song. Remind yourself, this is what God has said about me. Psalms 139 and 14, Psalms 139 and 14, God said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God created me to be who I am. And everything about me, God created it about me. It is important that you and I understand and know that. Now, what else does he say? What else does the enemy say? Because the enemy is always coming against me, Pastor. He's picking out things about me, and he's talking about me. Well, the enemy does, uh, he says, you're alone. You're by yourself. The enemy says, don't nobody love you, don't nobody care about you, you're going to be by yourself for the rest of your life. That's what the enemy says. But here's what you need to know, Matthew 28 and 20. Jesus said, no, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Woo! Now listen, now listen, some people want Jesus and Tyrone too. Oh, praise the Lord. But you know what I found out? I learned that loneliness is an emotional signal that God wants to spend some time with you. Can I say that again? I think I will. Loneliness 
is a emotional signal that God wants to spend time with you. Oh, my God. He said, no, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Even if everyone else leave you, you got to know deep in your heart that God is with you. Ah, oh, well, what else do the enemy say? Well, the enemy be doing a whole bunch of talking. See, the, the enemy says, the enemy says, nobody loves you. Ah, oh, and I had heard people so many times say, Pastor, don't nobody love me. They just don't love me. And I'm like, wait a minute, where you get that from? God says he loved you enough to send Jesus to die for you. John 3, 16. Mm-hmm. That, that's a good verse, and most of us remember that from, from our youth. John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world. They gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son, 17 verse says, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God sent Jesus to earth because he loves you. He cares deeply about you, so much so that he sent his son to die for you. See, the devil starts singing to you that you are terminally ill. You're going to die. And I know how many people have he said that to. Your time is just about up. Mm-hmm. Well, how many of you know that all of us are going to die with something one day? <laughs> all of us are going to die of something one day. The key is be ready. But the word says when the tabernacle, what tabernacle? This tabernacle dissolves. We have another building not made by the hands of man. If I perish, let me perish. See, I'm not scared to die. I'm not afraid of death. And our job as a church is to get you prepared for eternity. So that's when, that's when, uh, 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 so that when we are facing death, you can walk with confidence knowing that I'm ready to meet the Lord Jesus. He's the master of my life. When the devil said, go ahead and steal it, go ahead, take that, put that in your pocket. Ain't nobody going to see you. Take something out of that store. But God said, don't steal. Luke 6.38. He said, give. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And let me say this. There are some Christians who will fall out over money. Mm. You can handle anything, but when money comes into the picture, some Christian will fall out. You know, money really changes a lot of people. But let me say this. When it comes to being a Christian, hallelujah, we ought to be in a state where we can say to people, you know what? I'm not going to fight you over this money. If that's the way you want to act. You go ahead. I'm not going to fight you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I just want, oh, my God, I just wanted to give you a few examples. Oh, my God. But the reality is there's there's situation after situation where the devil says things to you, but God has an answer for everyone. Now, here's something I want to challenge you with, okay? I challenge you as a part of your devotion, as a part of your reading the word, as a part of your walk with God, I want to challenge you to do a simple thing. And that is, any time God speaks to you, any time God illuminates a word for you, any time he knows that you are in anticipation of something, and you start reading the scriptures expecting God to say something to you, when he speaks to you, Journal it. 
journal it. See, that is a very important uh, aspect of every Christian life, and every Christian should learn how to journal things. Get you a book and write it out, journal it, put the date in, put down what God told you. And then once you look back over that book, you see all the things God said to you, and you see all the things that have taken place in your life, it will give you strength. It will give you the, oh, my God, the confidence that you need that God is still working in your life. Take a marker and highlight in your Bible and underline it and, and find out what the application is for your life. Is this, oh, my God, if you would do this, uh, you would find that your life would be enriched every day. When God speaks into your concern, when he speaks into our situation, this is how we do battle with the enemy. If the devil, if the devil wins, it is because the devil beat you when you don't have a word to quote back. Let me say that again because my tongue got tired. Let me say again. Anytime the devil beats you, it's because you don't have a word. To quote back, whoo, hallelujah. This is why I try to encourage my members and everybody I meet, learn the word of God. Get that word down in you. So when the devil says something, you got to come back. You got to come back. You got to have a weapon. You got to have a word to throw back at him. He's messing with you. He's talking with you. He's strumming your core. But if you don't have a word to fight him back, That's how the devil wins. Praise God. Then you get into conversation with someone, and you're so impressed, not because your church hasn't told you what was true. It's just that you have never came to hear what your church said is true. So now you're running behind a false religion because you don't know the word. Then you call me and say, Pastor Don, I, I, I can no longer come to your church because I'm a Pharisee now. Pastor Don, I'm a Sadducee now. And I use those two words because I didn't want to call no religion out. You wasn't coming to church in the first place. That's why you got to where you are now. If you have been coming and learning and applying and applying, you wouldn't have been tricked by those various false religions. And I want to say this because there's somebody on the line right now who is being tricked, being fooled by false religions. And that's why I always encourage all of you to get involved with a Bible teaching church. It is very highly important that you just don't come here on Tuesday nights for your spiritual enrichment, that you join and get attached to a Bible teaching church so that you will learn how to fight the enemy, so that you will you will know what the truth is when the enemy begins talk telling you a lie. So that's how the devil wins. We don't know the word. We just don't know the word. Uh, my people are destroyed. How? Lack of knowledge. We know more of the world than we know of the word. Mm. And I can't shout it loud enough. <laughs> I can't get you to see it, hear it loud enough. You got to get the word in your heart. Do what you have to do to get that word. Learn that word and ask God to make that word alive to you. I'm telling you, There's going to be times when your human reasoning, your flesh, your emotions, your friends, and everybody is going to be telling you all kinds of stuff, but you can only make it and survive it by getting rock solid in the Word and living your life based upon what the Word of God says. Hallelujah. Get it in your head. Get it in your heart. Make it a practice. Don't go by what you feel. Get that word in you. Okay, I can get down off my soapbox. Let's go back to Ephesians 6. Praise God. So so, so Paul finishes up this section with verse 18. He finishes up this 
this uh, section with verse 18. And he gives us another important component of spiritual warfare. Hmm. Ephesians 6, 18 through 19 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that others may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's verse 18 and 19. Those two verses are powerful. Oh, my God. They are the final key that unlocks the door, the power of prayer. See, God wants us to be prayer warriors. See, some people, when drama comes, they they start praying. And when they don't have any drama, prayer becomes secondary. But over and over again, the scripture gives us specific about the value of prayer. In Luke 6 and 12, Jesus himself prayed all night long. Now, if Jesus had to pray, what do you think you're going to have to do? And some of us don't even know how to pray. If you ever get to visit Africa, you will see that their commitment to God put America's prayer lives to shame. Mm. What do you say, Pastor? I say again, their commitment to God puts America prayer lives to shame. I'm telling you, those saints in those underdeveloped nations are amazing. If they get a hold to something, they go to rocking and praying and rocking and praying. I mean, you just have to stop them. They pray for hours. <sighs> hours. See, Jesus prayed all night. Daniel prayed three times a day in Daniel 6 and 10. And I know some of you said, well, Pastor, I pray three times a day. Yeah, but that's over your meal. In Luke 18 and 1, Jesus commanded us that we ought to always pray. That's his words to us, that we should be people of prayer, that men ought to always pray and not lose heart or not faint. See, it's hard to lose heart when you're talking with God. Oh, I just, I need you to understand that. Mm -hmm. By the way, prayer is two-way communication. Do I need to say that again? I think I will. Prayer is two-way conversation. Is you're talking to God and you're letting God talk to you. Two-way communication. It goes both ways. First Thessalonians five seventeen, Paul declared that we should pray without ceasing. Now here's how I see that. Here's how I try and live my life. I'm in a constant mode of prayer. Hmm. I'm praying while I'm driving. I'm praying while I'm in a meeting. See, I don't have to get down on my knees. I don't have to bow my head. I don't have to position my hands in a certain fashion. I'm talking with God sometimes out loud and sometimes in my spirit. Now, Lord, give me the directions. Lord, help me to keep my mouth closed while this person is cussing me out. Lord, please help me to respond right. Give me the answers to this dilemma. Please help me, oh, Lord, to do the right thing and make the right choices. It's a lifestyle of being in constant prayer, constant communications with God, praying always without ceasing. In Ephesians 6, Paul actually lays out how we should pray. Now, try and follow me as I talk about seven specific components and elements that he gives us about prayer. I'm going to cover seven specific components and elements 
that Paul gives us about praying. See, I come across a lot of people who want to be blessed and highly favored. We hear that all the time. And very few people who want to be prayer warriors. But if it, but it's being a prayer warrior that's going to get your situation turned around. So how do we pray, Pastor? Look at Ephesians 6, 18. He starts off saying, 6, 18, praying always. That's how it starts off, praying always. I call that the posture of prayer, the posture, P-O-S-T-U-R-E, the posture of prayer. We should have a posture of prayer, and the two words that Paul, that Paul uses is praying always. So what does that mean? The word prayer means directing my need and request towards God. Directing my need and request toward God. Hmm. Now, here's why that's important. A lot of people are not directing, directing their needs and request, requests towards God. They are talking to everybody who will listen to them talk. Some of you are talking about your situation to too many people. Please hear me. Stop talking to people about your problems. You know why? They really don't care. They got their own drama, they got their own pain, and they got their own situations. And you know what else? They can't do anything about it anyway. But what's awesome is you talk to God about it, and God sends somebody to speak to you about your situation. And you know that nobody knew it about, uh, nobody knew anything about it but you and God. And that's how you know that it's God who made it happen. There wasn't something that you told everybody. So the word praying in this particular verse is a Greek word that has a twofold meaning. One, it means directing it towards God, directing it towards God. And two, it means to worship, to worship. So praying always means I'm going to direct my needs and requests towards God while at the same time I'm going to worship him. It is imperative that we learn that while we are going through, we still worship God. If the devil can take the praise and the worship out of your mouth, he will be victorious at what he ultimately want to happen. You and I have to learn how to worship God, worship him through thick and thin, through hell and high water. We have to have the confidence that I know God hears me. I know God loves me. I know God is going to bring me out of this situation. He didn't bring you through all of the drama that you went through in your past to bring you to this spot and abandon you. He didn't bring you all the way to leave you and forsake you. This isn't the kind of God that we serve. He's the kind of God that says, I'm going to see you to the end. He says, I'm going to finish what I started with you. I'm going to bring you, oh God, to completion. I'm going to bring you to completion. I'm going to bring you to the fulfillment to what I had destined you to do. So we have to learn to worship him. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know about you, but God's credit is good with me. I don't have to wait till it's done. I don't have to wait till it's fixed. I don't have to wait to it's solved. His credit is good with me. I can go ahead and praise him ahead of time for what I know he's going to do. 
I don't know about you. I don't know what you're going through, but somebody on this line ought to say, God, I thank you ahead of time. You want to get the attention of God? Be a person who worships him. That's what brought so much joy to the Lord about Job. You know about the trial of Job when God told Satan, said, hey, you consider my servant Job. And Satan said, yeah, I saw him. I, I seen him. Uh-huh. But you got a hedge around him. You move that hedge and I make him curse you to your face. So God took the hedge down. Oh, my way. And he said, you can't kill him. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do with Job. Can you picture that? God had that kind of confidence in Job to know that he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, my question, can God say that about you? Can God tell Satan, I'm removing the head, do what you want to do? They're still going to worship me. They're still going to love me. Are you that kind of a Christian? Mm. Praise God. Praying always means I'm fixed toward God at all times. All the times I'm putting my face towards the Lord always. Praying always also means I got the right spirit, that, that when I come to him, I ain't mad. When I come to him, I'm not bitter. Now, don't get me wrong, because God can handle you being upset and mad. But approach God with the right spirit. We got to learn how to approach God. You do know that he's God. Am I right? Praise God. And let me say this. If he allowed it to come into your life, then whatever happened in your life didn't shock God. He didn't wake up and say, oh, my God. <laughs> or let me put it like this. He didn't wake up and say, oh, me. <laughs> it didn't catch him by surprise. He already knew what was coming down the pipe. He already knew what you were going to do. To, to go through. He already knew what you were going to say. And if you couldn't handle it, he wouldn't have allowed it to come into your life. So the very fact that he allowed it at your doorstep means that God approved it and he knew what you had. He knew that you had what it takes, I'm trying to say, to properly respond. And be in proper fellowship with God. Be in communion with God. Be in right standing. If you did something that you know you shouldn't have done, repent. Repent. He already saw what you did, so you certainly ain't had anything from him. Just repent. And always, always, the word always don't mean that you have to be Always down on your knees. When it says praying always, it don't mean you always have to be down on your knees. Prayer has nothing to do with the posture of my body. Mm -mm. I'm glad we serve a God that we don't have to be facing in any particular direction for him to answer my prayers. You can be facing me and cussing me out, and I can still be praying. You can be calling me all kinds of names, and I can be talking to God. The posture that's important is praying always. Directing our need towards God and worship him at all times with the right mind. Now, the question that comes to my mind right here is how do we pray? How do we pray, Pastor? Well, the second component of prayer is the petition. The petition. The first component was praying always. The second component is the petition. Verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. And these two components, prayer and supplications, I'm calling them petitions. 
We're making a petition before God. Now, let's, let me get into this a little bit. <clears throat> Prayer and supplication. What's the difference between the two? Prayer means worshiping God. There it is again. God says back to back, be a worshiper. I look forward to the day when people come to church and we don't have to have a cheerleader, have our cheerleaders up front cheering people on. I'm looking forward to the day when people come in with praise and worship on their lips. They come in singing God's praise, ready to exalt God's name and glorify him. I'm going through hell, but I'm still with God. I still still know that he's God. I don't understand the dilemma I'm, that's in my life, but I know God is going to work it out. That's what we're looking for people to get to, that point in their life. The devil defeats us, oh, my God, in spiritual warfare because he gets us to focus on the situation and not on God. That's how the devil defeats us. We get so tied up in the situation. Hmm. So zoomed in that we can't even worship God. If you have a problem and it has you so drawn down where you can't worship God, then the devil has won. He's won. But let me cheer you on. Let me argue, let me preach and teach and let me declare, let me pull you out of that hell hole. Let me tell you to, to praise God no matter what you feel. Praise him no matter how you feel. Praise him no matter what your circumstances are. Worship God. He's worthy to be praised. He's still God. No matter what you're going through, he's still God. You might not like it, but he's still God. And that's one of the components of spiritual warfare that you learn how to be a worshiper. You have to learn how to be a worshiper. Think of the last thing that ticked you off. Think of the last thing that had you fearful and frustrated, that had you angry. What did you do? Did you worship God? Hmm. And then supplication means to solicit God, to cry out to him, to beg him. I gather what my needs are, and I bring it to God, and I lay it at his altar. I cry out to God. I solicit God. I'm so glad that we serve a God who inclined his ears to our cry. He's a God who loves us and cares about us. The second component, again, of prayer is petition. The third is power. The third component is power. The 18th verse continues to say, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Mm. Praying in the spirit. Now, now, what does in the spirit mean? This is a term that is used in many, many areas of scripture. Praying in the spirit. I believe praying in the spirit means I'm not praying according to my flesh. Well, what does it mean, Pastor, in my flesh? Sometimes when we pray, we ask God for stuff that is generated by what our flesh wants and not by what God wants. You know, like someone praying to God for someone else's husband to be their husband. Now, you know that ain't God. That's your flesh talking. God, hurry up and let his divorce come through so that we can get married. What? I actually have people tell me that God led them to get a divorce so that they could marry 
someone else. What? Why do you feel that the God that we serve hallelujah, is going to break a family up to make you happy? I believe in the spirit means to allow the Holy Spirit to pray for and through us. To allow the Holy Spirit to pray for and through us in the spirit. Romans 8, 26 and 8, 27. 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we are. Oh, my God. How many of you believe that's true? We know not what we should pray for as we are. Sometimes we don't even know what to pray. <laughs> and I can tell you by the thing, I can tell you that I know, I know this <laughs> by the thing, by the things that I hear people pray. And I can tell that they don't know what to pray. Just listen to them. See, they are not praying for challenges and problems. You're praying for relief. Oh, this is, I want you to pay real close attention to this area. Sometimes God wants issues in your life to bring some maturity to you. Sometimes God wants issues in your life to purge some attitude in you that wasn't right. He allowed it to come into your life to straighten you out. And see, the saints don't go around praying for pressure. They pray for pleasure, not for pressure. We don't want that. We, we don't pray for trials and tribulations. I never heard anyone ever pray, Lord, send some tribulation to my life that I might mature. Mm -mm. We don't know... <laughs> We don't know what we ought to pray for. But here's what I like about this verse. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us. See, see, God uses pressure. And he uses tribulation. And he uses pain. And he uses suffering. And he uses things to get us to a level that he wants us to be. He uses those things. So when we pray, we're not praying God send tribulation into my life. We pray God help me to overcome this issue. We pray God help me to God help me to grow so they won't be affected by these things. That's how we pray. We pray for the end result, but the scripture says the spirit itself makes intercessions for us with groanings, which cannot be other. And then the 27th verse says, And he that searches the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit. Now hear this. Because he maketh intercessions for the saints. How? According to the will of God. Oh, that's a powerful verse. Powerful verse. That 27 verse, let me read that 27 verse again. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the spirit. Knoweth the, is what is the mind of the spirit. And how, because he maketh intercessions for the saint. And how he do that? According to the will of God. That Romans 8, 27, 26 and 27 is some powerful verses. The Holy Ghost prays for you in according to what God's will is. So while you're asking God to move the thing, oh, hallelujah, the Holy Ghost is saying, leave it right there, God. They're seeking you more like they never sought you before. They are getting in their word like they never have. They're coming to Bible study. They're fasting. They're fellowshipping more. Lord, leave it right there. It's working. Leave it there until we get all that mess 
inside of them out. Leave it there until we get selfishness out. Leave it there until we get pride out of there. Leave it there until jealousy comes out. Keep it right there, Lord. He maketh intercessions according to the will of God. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! I know you weren't expecting that. So we have to allow the Holy Spirit to pray through us. Can you just imagine? I want you to understand. Some Sometimes we say, Lord, give me more patience. And the Holy Spirit would say, send them more crazy folks into his life, Lord. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you sitting there battling with all these crazy folks, and you wonder what in the world? Well, you said, Lord, give me patience. You said, Lord, help me to tolerate. But the Holy Spirit translating it for you. What I'm saying is, he makes his intercession. The Spirit makes his intercessions according to the will of God. So we got to let the have, Spirit have his way. And we have to stop praying those programmed prayers. Let me say that again. Please, y'all, hear me. Stop praying those programmed prayers. God is tired of your pre-programmed prayers. Same prayer every day. You just plug in a different name. That's not what God desires. Matthew 6 and 7 says, but when ye pray, use not vain repetition." Uh-uh. We can't get into a posture where we just keep repeating words over and over and over again. That's not the will of God for us. Pre-programmed prayers. Mm -mm. Phrases. You heard other people pray and you put them in your prayers and you, and you don't even know what they're talking about. Just You just heard something. Well, that sounds good. I'm going to put that in my prayer. Pre-programmed prayer. Well, let me take a moment to talk about prayer languages right here. About tongues. Oh, my time. Okay, I got to pick it up. I believe the spiritual gifts are still for us today. We know that there are different types of tongues, and one of them is the tongue, which is prayer language where you allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you to God. You yield to allow the Holy Ghost to in intercede on your behalf before the Father. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, and then verses 14 and 15, 1 Corinthians 14, chapter 14, verse 2, and verses 14 and 15 gives illustrations of that. And he calls the term praying with the Spirit. That's what I believe. I believe we are allowing the Holy Spirit to intercede to God on our behalf through us, us being human vessels. That's power. That is the third component, power of prayer. The fourth component of prayer is prudence, prudence. What does prudence mean, P-R-U? D-E-N-C-E, -E, prudence. What does prudence mean? Well, verse 18, again, speaks of being watchful. That's what prudence means, being watchful. I'm going to be awake. I'm not going to fall asleep. I'm not going to stop praying. See, the devil wants to put you in a sleep mode. Hmm. What I mean by a sleep mode is that he, he wants to get you in a place where you just don't care anymore. I'm not talking about physical sleep. I'm not talking about falling asleep because you're going to do that. I'm talking about getting to a place where you stop praying. You start watching to see how God is going to solve the dilemma. See, when you are a person of faith, you have to get to the place where when you talk to God, and cast all your cares on him. When you get up, you're looking to see how he's going to answer what you just talked to him 
to him about. Being watchful means I'm not going to lose faith that I serve a God who has the ability to fix my dilemma. I'm looking, I'm expecting. I don't know how he's going to work it out. I don't know how he's going to fix it. And I don't know how he's going to resolve the problem or change it. But somehow, some way, God is going to bring me out. So I'm getting up praying and believing that somehow God is going to, to work a miracle on my behalf. But the devil wins when he gets you to a place where you stop being watchful, where you stop praying, where you just don't care, where you just, you know, you, you just want to lose your faith. Well, let me tell you something. God may not come as rapidly as you want him to come, but you can always rest assured that when he shows up, he will be on time. He's not governed by the deadlines people put on you. He don't care about the first of the month or the 15th of the month. He owns the mortgage company people. He owns all of that. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's not driven by time. Get up and be watchful. Get up looking with anticipation of how God is going to work your situation out. We are people of faith, and we believe that God is going to somehow, some way, work it out on our, in our time. I'm watchful. I'm watchful. I refuse to go into hibernation. I refuse to sleep. I refuse to, put, to, to go to a place where I, I begin to doubt that God cares about me and that God will fight my battle. I refuse to go there. I'm watching the mailbox. Why? Because I don't know there might be a check in there for me. I'm calling those bill collectors back. Why? One might be saying, I don't know how it happened, but our records show that your bill has been paid. We have to get to the point where we refuse to sleep. We refuse. That's the fourth component. The fifth component a prayer is persevere, 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 persevere. Pray with perseverance. That means to continue steadily in spite of opposition. Don't let, praise God, hear me good, don't let a little challenge stop or slow you down. Persevere. Keep pushing forward. Pray with perseverance. Again, that's one of those things I wish people could see uh, the way the people of Africa pray. Uh, oh, my God, if you ever see the people in Africa do church, we got cars, but those people walk to church for miles, miles. I remember the, my first trip to Jamaica. I was going to church, and somehow I got off track and got turned all around up in the mountains. I was a little discouraged because I knew, I knew I was going to miss service. But a friend of my brother told me, don't worry, even though we will be uh, two hours late. <laughs> when we got there, the saints were waiting on us because they heard we was coming. Did you hear what I said? Two hours late, and the church, the saint, didn't even go home because they heard he had called saying, I got one of the brothers from the States is coming, and I want you to meet him. Now, if that had been in America and the pastor was two hours late, uh, I can see people looking at their car walking out the door now. They came to church without shoes, heads. Their hair beaded up and everything. If you don't get your hair done, you ain't going to church. But I tell you what, if your drama gets painful enough, you'll forget about what about your shoes, you'll forget about your hair, you will persevere. Oh, praise God. The sixth component of prayer. The sixth component of prayer. I'm almost at the seventh. The sixth component of prayer is people, people, 
Verse 18 goes on to say, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Pray for all the saints. Pray for people. God, help us to raise up people who will go into prayer, not just for their own situation, but who will pray for other people. The last part of verse 18 said to do it for all the saints. Somebody prayed for you. That's how you got this far. Somebody called out your name. Somebody talked to God on your behalf. Long before you knew what prayer was, somebody prayed for you. For you, I'm asking God, God, make us a people of prayer. GTT, Gospel Truth Tabernacle, got to where it is today because we have prayer warriors in our church. I am grateful for our prayer warriors. I'm grateful for the intercessors and the people who plead to God on behalf of our church. I am grateful to God for that. Oh, my God, where would we be without the praying saints? And finally, the seventh component of prayer, the seventh component of prayer is pray for people who are in positions of authority. Pray for people who are in positions of authority. These are the principles and the components of spiritual warfare prayer that's outlined by Paul right here in Ephesians 6. And here's what he says in Ephesians 6, 19. 6, 19 Ephesians, King James Version. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Ooh, hallelujah. He said, while you're praying, Pray for me. And let me tell you, there's something powerful about praying for your spiritual authorities. It is an important component of life. And when you pray, get people's name. Call out their name. Get to learn problems. Get to know folks. Put that name on the author. The more challenges you have, the more struggles you face, the more temptations you pray, pray for your spiritual authorities. Hold them up. In prayer, again, it is an important component of spiritual warfare. Pray for the people who covers you. Oh, and I want you to know I'm just like Paul. I'm not ashamed to say, y'all pray for me. Write, somebody, write this down. Donald L. Kirkwood. Call my name out. I need your prayers. This is not an easy job is a very stressful assignment, and I need your prayers every day. Oh, my God. And that concludes our series on spiritual warfare. Hallelujah. I pray that you are in a much better position because of it. I give God the glory. I give God the honor. I'm just thankful that he allows us to sit here and live it and hear it and study it. And I want you to know that if you miss some of the tapes, go back to the church website, pull up the tapes, and start it all over again. The Spiritual Spiritual Warfare Series, seven parts, seven parts. And I thank God that we finished it up. So with that, I extend the hand for those who not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And I want you to know that it is about you opening up your mouth and you confessing. See, you can't confess something that ain't already done. If you have a desire to accept Christ as your personal Savior, God has already picked your heart. He's already pricked you. It's called quickening. He's quickened your spirit. And he's quickened you, then you can confess it. He says you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. That is Romans 9 and 10. You got, you got, oh, oh, my God, I just want you to understand 
Oh, I just want you to hear it in 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 in, in, in the context that I mean it. It is important that you understand and receive God into your bosom. Receive God into your bosom. It's not enough to go around and say, I am saved. Yes, I am saved. Yes, I gave my life to God, but you don't live. You have no proof. You have no strength. Mm, 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 mm. I think I said 9, 10 for Romans. Uh, if I did, it's Romans 10 and 9. Spirit just told me, just say, Spirit said 10 and 9, that if thou would confess the Lord God, Lord Jesus, that, that, uh, that he is the son, that, that if thou would confess, confess that the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, the devil trying to tap my tongue up, but he is not going to do it because I'll stay here until I get it right. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. And then the 10th verse, uh, Romans 10 and 10, goes on to say, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto some, to salvation. Oh, Lord, I just want to let you know, I just want to let you know, I just want to let you know that God is standing near and dear, and he wants you to give your life to him. And once you do that, saints, please, Hear me clearly. Find a Bible teaching church to join and get involved in. I didn't say join a church because they got a, a slamming choir. I didn't say join a church because they got a lot of young men or a lot of pretty women in the church. I said join a church that is a Bible teaching church. You need the word of God. If you ever need the word uh, at any time in your life, you surely need him now. And with that, now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless, oh, my God, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And we all say amen. Until next week with another episode of From the Pastor's Death, I say to each and every one of you, love ye one another. Good night and God bless.